I like this time of the night and or morning when uh, we've had a bunch of already great open line calls. So the show's already, as far as I'm concerned, kind of in the bag. You all are just frosting on it all. And so let's start with uh, William in uh, Tennessee on Coast to Coast AM. William? Hey, okay, great. Well, first of all, uh, I hate that you missed being generation part of Generation X. What's that? Just barely. I missed barely. Generation X. Next there, there, uh, but congratulations on your. Uh, I missed the first part where you were saying something about inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame coming Brilliant. up. This, yeah, thank you. Congratulations, you deserve. Yeah. I think they're. I think they just needed Buddy somebody up. to. I think they needed somebody to cover oh, yeah. where a painting had been, so they put some spackle up, and that's how I got it. But anyway. uh, what about uh, uh, Altamont in '69? Oh yeah, uh, where you weird know vibe. the guy out the gun. Yeah, weird vibe. Weird vibe from the get on that. We had a guest many years ago who wrote a book on on how that all came together or came apart, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Ultima was one of those things that from the beginning, people just sort of felt like this is really uh, sort of, it, it had an, a kind of an atmosphere that was one that wasn't warming up to be a great show. It was full of animosity and um, the Hell's Angels didn't help, obviously. Never ever anybody to have a gun or a knife at a rock show. Yeah, I don't think that's ever a very good idea. Where are you in Tennessee, William? I'm actually truck driving through Memphis about to cross the Mississippi River to Arkansas. Oh, great. Great. Great times. I uh, appreciate that. Let me get to Nicholas in Santa Rosa on Coast to Coast. Uh, Nicholas? Hi. Good evening. Uh, first time calling um, since uh, probably 35 years listening off and wow. on. Wow. And uh, Glad you got I wanted work. to talk about my uh, my concert experiences, which started yeah. about 50 years ago, right in the Philly area, downtown there where the Spectrum and JFK Stadium are. Right. Um, my first show, I was 13, it'll be uh, 50 years, was Yes. It was an afternoon show. <laughs> right. And it was the Tales of Topographic Oceans tour. Wow. Um, the classic lineup with Wakeman, Hal. Yeah. Uh, Squire. Um, Who's a very underrated bassist, as far as I'm concerned. An amazing show. You know, when yeah. back in, you know, we'd have self, yeah, of course, uh, the people lighting matches for the encore. I remember right. it was just completely <laughs> lit up at the spectrum. That's Again, cool. It was my very first concert, and it was an afternoon concert, and I was all 13. Uh, the next show that I wanted to mention was. 45 years ago. I, I thought it was 81 when I talked to Tom, but I think it was, I, I looked it up while I was waiting, and it was the 78 JFK Rolling Stones show, which huh. almost became a riot. Oh. Reason being, it turned out Mick was sick, and there was 100,000 plus people, and they came out. I thought it was about 50 minutes, but I read it said 85, and it was off. It wasn't a great performance. And after that, I thought, you know what? I don't really like the crowd that much. I right. didn't really love the show. Right. And I kind of enjoyed more or less just the other concerts that were going on uh, and what have you. So I, I didn't see the Stones again until 98, the Bridges of Babylon with Santana opening. Oh, that would have been great. Ago. Yeah. And that was phenomenal. That, you know, that's, I realized, yes, they are the best rock and roll band in the world. You know, and uh, I think it's fair to point out that Rolling Stones Live doesn't always correlate to the quality of the album they're touring on. And so I think that we were kind of busting on some of the, the mid range or latter day Stones albums, but that it doesn't always affect the way they perform live, which I, I think they, they pro if they don't spend too much time on the new material, uh, you know, I, I think anyway that, uh, that, that there's some really great shows on really bad albums that were out at the time. The Bridges, they, they did 
quite a few songs, and, and they were they were quite good. I have the tape of that show, right? Uh, but they did them yeah. live, and that's different than I think this how right. the studio sound, right? The the gentleman who called a little earlier and mentioned the Altamont show. I'm here in Northern California. The reason the vibe was off. Number one, the dad had a relationship with the Hell's Angels. The Stones just thought these were like hard security. So there was that sort of thing. They didn't know the, the gist of the Hell's Angels that well. No. So uh, there was that. And the big thing was that the, the show was all set to be in Golden Gate Park until the city commissioner. That's right. Francisco, so you can't uh, do that. Yeah, they, they put yeah. the, the quash on it. I yeah. want to mention one, uh, one more show. I saw hundreds of hundreds. Well, I saw 302 dead shows, but I'm not going to get into the great. <laughs> I'm from Trenton, New Jersey, originally. And yeah. um, when I was about, well, it was actually also 74. In fact, it was the month he hit Time Magazine. I saw Bruce with Claire, you know, Springsteen yeah. with the East Street fan, right before he was on the cover. That same month, I think sure. it was November. And they played the Trenton War Memorial, oh, interesting. Pete Hall. And Bruce was all dressed in a white suit with a black yeah. tie. And Claire right. was dressed in all black with a white tie. Oh, and it cool. was just an, a, a phenomenal show, Rosalita Encore. Oh, um, doesn't get any better than that. Great song, Rosalita. And I will say, uh, having lived in New Jersey for a while, I was trying to explain, maybe that you can't relate to this, but I was trying to explain Cats on a Smooth Surface um, to somebody um, that there was this, you know, there's this band that was in in North Jersey that, like, anybody who came from North Jersey played in that band at one time or another. And you don't see that very often anymore. These bands that just really make it on, you know, they're, they're, they don't have albums out. They don't have, but they they have longevity because they're a well, great local act. So, yeah, I think part of that, there was a, a, a very active shore circuit. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's what I knew of. Uh, yeah. Uh, that cats on a smooth surface. Played at that time, I lived down the shore of Monmouth County, and they would play a place in Seabright called Trade Winds. And Adam sure, Park and I know just up, where that is. Yeah, some of the clubs there. Um, they were definitely a prolific uh, touring shore band, like uh, Southside Johnny. They're right there yeah. on the South Side. Yeah. So, and they played the Stone Pony all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just mentioning that because I just thought. Because Springsteen played with them, Patty Scalfa, I think, was him. There was used to be a joke like, "You're so Jersey if you've you've been in Cats on a Smooth Surface." But all right, let me move on. But get, uh, I enjoyed those reminiscences. Uh, Daniel's in Alaska on Coast to Coast. Daniel, hey Ian, we had Good big problems from, in Alaska. Uh, the the uh, I'm heard- in North Pole right now. Yeah, but have you uh, figured, have you heard the story about the crab problem around? Oh uh, uh, yeah, the snow crabs. Uh, yeah, two years in a row they've the canceled warming, the season. The ocean is warming, and they're starving and, to death. Yeah, the, it's it's the warming oceans. It affects the Arctic too, the high Arctic as yeah. well. We're experiencing a thinning of the ice packs, and that some that's a reduction of the. The habitat there, the platform sure, for that marine bears. mammals need to survive. Right. So we're starting to see stranded marine mammals. Ugh, heartbreak. Um, it, and we're, we see them a lot on the beach on the north slope of Alaska, too. And the reason I mentioned I saw a story on CNN that said two billion snow crab are missing. That That's it because was, of the warming waters. Our harvest went down from like 8.9 billion Three or four years ago to six billion to four billion, oh. and so they just put a they put a halt on it. They're like, yeah, this has to slow down. Yeah, uh, and we're going to start seeing those crab populations moving north. In fact, I read an article yesterday that we're starting to get uh, chum salmon in the Itkalapa and uh, Colville huh. River and Anaktuvik rivers on the huh. North Slope. So we're we're starting to get salmon on the north. Which coast. which ordinarily you didn't get. We have members of the Salmonidae family, um, so we have cousins of the salmon. But we're Not starting to get salmon, some salmon on the on the mainland on the North Slope. But oh, that's great. I, I was calling to talk about the aurora, and yeah. uh, most people beautiful. think that the aurora is just this beautiful phenomenon in the sky, and but. 
we are at an 11 year solar maximum every 11 years the sun does something crazy the last time it was 2012 the next one will be 2034 but we measure the aurora on a index called the kp index Hmm. zero means there's no activity nine means end of the world and the last time we had a kp9 was in 1859 Mm -hmm. i want everybody out there to google the carrington event and now we didn't have the technology to measure we didn't have satellites and all that stuff to measure it on a right, right. Index. they didn't even but they saw all the way down to mexico during the daytime yeah at the same time the half the telegraph system melted oh, the other really? half was working with no power source and houses sporadically throughout north america caught on fire from the nails in the roofs they now, if we had that today a kp9 display it, it would uh, i got to pick the brains of a space force scientist for a couple hours driving right in. go ahead no no i said yeah and, and and um we were talking about the carrington event and he told me if we had a carrington event level today the half of the earth facing the sun there anything with a circuit from a cell phone to a nuclear power plant, yeah. airplanes, cars, anything would just cease to work. Ugh. On the other half of the world, all of their electrical stuff would cease to work too. And for 10 days, nothing on Earth electrical-wise would work because the mantle would be so supercharged. Yeah. Now, the aurora normally occurs up in the ionosphere. and um, But this year, we're already getting an amazing season up here um through march late march early april and um but the the reason i was calling because i read an article today that every 10 years there is a 12 percent chance of a kp9 which is the the carrington event level the killer one so that's more threatening than a large meteor or probably equal to a super volcano because it would basically bring us back to the Stone Age. And um, okay. uh, the only people who wouldn't know it would be the tribal people or people living way off the grid like in right. cabins. Right, because Alaska. they already got that going on. Yeah. yeah that was very – it's it's a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure hey, to talk to – go ahead. Pleasant Valley Reindeer Ranch. Come up and see me. <laughs> ah, no, I, pre- I love that. I in fact – I mean, I know it's not the same, and you'll mock me, but my wife and I keep talking about taking an Alaska tour because I just I love Alaska. Uh, east of the Rockies, Julie is in Ohio on Coast to Coast. Julie? Hi, Ian. How are you? Hey, good. And you? Good. Um, well, first I wanted to tell you I saw Donnie and Marie Osmond at the Palace Theater <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> I, could, I could do you one better. A good friend what? of mine here on campus dated yeah. Jimmy Osmond. So, no way. Yeah, and we tease her about that all the time. Like, cause I'm hilarious. friends with her husband. I'm like, yeah, I could have married Jimmy Osmond. You know, so. Well, I look a lot like the Osmond family. So when I, we were kids, my my family we, or friends would say, which one is Julie, which one is Billy in terms of my brother and sister. But anyway, all right. Okay. I, saw, I called because I saw Lyle Lovett oh. in a venue in Kansas City, and I can't remember where, um, if it was in New uh, Midtown or Overland Park or oh, wherever. Oh, that would have been I, good. Um, it was open air, oh. and he was, I think he was by himself, and he's coming to Colum- uh, He's coming to Newark, Ohio next weekend with oh, you're gonna see him. Yeah, I, you know, I love, there's certain albums of his I just still love, and um, when um, he, I saw him in Minneapolis at uh, one of the restored theaters in in that district, and it was such a great show, but it was with the whole band, and it, it was just, uh, it was well, amazing. Do you know yeah. which venue it might have been in Kansas City that it was open air? It was very small. Yeah, I don't know them well enough because okay. I don't go to shows there, but I, I, I can look it up, and and I, I will mention it the next time I'm on if I can okay. figure, figure well, out that. It was in, um, it was in the early, mid to like 93, 94, 95-ish area. I borrowed a friend's van, and I grabbed a couple of friends, and we just, oh, it was it was so amazing. It was a beautiful Kansas night, and I have strong ties to Kansas, and it was just, just it was awesome. Yeah, well, I, you know, I... I'll have to look. I'm sure there's there may even be more than one. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, I will definitely okay. look at that. I mean, I was just looking at, um, uh, and thank you so much. There's something about an open air show when the weather's just perfect and the sun is setting. It's just when I saw Paul McCartney at Cyclone Stadium or when people who go to Red Rocks all the time, catch great shows there too. And there's something about that atmosphere. It's, 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 it's just different, you know. Uh, all right, um, we got Rick and Mish again. He's on a first-time caller line. He'll take us to the bottom of the hour. Go ahead, Rick. Hi, uh, Ian. Happy to talk with you. I never imagined I could add to a story on Coast to Coast, but uh, I, think I, have, I think I have a story that will dovetail, uh, I'm sure, with the uh, Charlie Watts uh Mick Punching Jagger, out Mick Jagger uh, story. The debate you were having, yeah, when uh, Charlie got uh, all mad. Uh, I'm a longtime friend of Chooch McGee, who was their crew chief for years. And uh, he didn't talk about the Stones a whole lot, but uh, one of the stories he told was when they were, I don't remember if they were on the road or, or in the studio, but uh, he and Charlie were sitting there talking, and uh, Mick walked in and, and uh, Chooch said good morning or, you know, said, acknowledged uh, Mick walking in, and Mick just walked right by with, without showing any, you know, anything at all. And right. Charlie said, I don't believe he just said that. And, and she says, well, I, I never expect him to say hello back. I always say hello, but he never says anything back. And uh, I think that may have may have just been the same type of incident when yeah, the, he called the drummer. It uh, uh, yeah. disturbed his sensibilities enough. I, I wish I would have been on when uh, Harvey was there because I think that almost uh, – Disrupted a tour because uh, Charlie was so fed up, uh, yeah, yeah, irritated with uh, yeah. the way uh, Mick was treating the other people in the band. Yeah, I, I, I believe this, and I believe actually, I've heard a story where um, Mick Jagger had to kind of um, take responsibility for that in order to bring the band back together again. Um, and I don't, uh, maybe it was Mick and Keith that had to do that. Um, but yeah. Okay. That's a great story. And I, next time I talk to Car- uh, Harvey, I'll, I'll ask him about that. Um, so this brings us into this last half hour of open lines. And like I say, you know, this is that time of the night. It's kind of feeling the groove, laying back, having fun, no politics and all these fresh voices that you're hearing on open lines on coast to coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. I was trying to figure out what Julie from Ohio was talking about when she mentioned an outdoor theater where she saw Lyle Lovett in Kansas City. And I'm looking, and the only thing I can come up with, she said she wasn't sure whether it was in the suburbs or in the city. In Bonner Springs, um, there is a well-known amphitheater that was open at the time called the, uh, well, now it's called the Azura Amphitheater. I don't remember what it was originally called, but it's gone through a couple of different sponsorships. Um, but that that may be it. So, Julie, if you're listening, try Azura and see. That's a like a, a mortgage company. Maybe it's a mortgage company, but I know they do car loans and stuff like that in uh, in Kansas. Um, and so, if you take a look at that, take a look at those photos, see if that one looks familiar. That may be the best I can get. Let me go to Suzanne in New Jersey on Coast to Coast AM. Suzanne? Oh, hello, Ian. And uh, um, congratulations and you, a well-deserving award. I don't know about that, but it's I thank you. Coast, I... coast, coast to Coast is, is the greatest. Where else yeah. can you go in the world to listen to so many viewpoints and still be respectful of our humanity and good. and just, I liked how you described that. That's good. Uh, I'm telling you. I mean, if you you go to your next door neighbor, you can't talk to the thing. <laughs> that's that's really and, true. <laughs> I mean it, and you know, I mean, this is where we can unite. I mean, this is where right. our voices really reach people in their heart and that's where the light is the light yeah. is in the heart the heart has to be the sovereign the heart will rule the mind when you allow it and trust it yeah. we have to learn to trust ourselves. Well, these are good we're points all get through this together we're going to raise our consciousness and we're going to be a better world with all the things that are scary 
we're going to face them. We're not going to hide from them because there is no hiding. You know, I think I think you're right. And I think I think this is these have been a couple of very trying years. And I think it's easy for people to despair over that. But they shouldn't. Calvary's coming. I mean, I'm yeah. 75. I, I mean, I called because music's my love, my passion. It's it's pulled me through every dark point in every point of my life. And right. you know, from the point of, I mean, I'm I'm just excited because you're talking about music and and uh, you know, I, I'm thinking I've got to go down memory lane with with I and and. and Go back. That was why I was calling, not to be philosophical. No, sure. That's okay. At the same time, you know, to be philosophical too. But, <laughs> but remember, remember um, um, when I first was like, uh, I was so, so all along. As long as music is soulful, then it's sure. good. But uh, remember Buffalo Springfield. Remember oh yeah. Love. Remember those days and. Yeah. And I think to myself, I love the stories and and the person that was talking with um, about the stones and and you know revealing things that are very interesting, you know. And and it was a time where there was all these things were going on. We it's true. We were micromanaging every thought, word, or deed that people did. It was just happening. It was electric. It was change. It was everything, and that we that we, our consciousness could. Grasp and I think there's a point to. I'm going to interject a point there, if you don't mind, and that's to say this too. There was a time in media, in the history of media, uh, when we didn't know everything instantaneously, and so that helped build the mystery around a lot of these artists because you had to ask, you had to keep reading, you had to dig to find out the truth about albums or you know, performances or people. And I think that that's unfortunate that we live, maybe this is a one of those byproducts. There's just very little curiosity to me about these artists because we've been following them forever and they're all over YouTube. And, you know, there's no, there's no real mystery to it to me. But uh, Let me get to Ruth just because I'm going to try and get everybody in, Suzanne, but thank you for the kind thoughts. Interesting. Ruth is in Maryland on Coast to Coast AM for Open Lines. Go ahead, Ruth. Hi. Hi, Ian. Thank you so much for taking my call. You re- you might remember me. I called a couple of weeks ago about the cat named Oswald and said to me, yeah. change his name. Well, yeah. he didn't like having his name changed. I had to change it back. Uh. But anyway, I, uh, he, liked, he, he likes Oswald. I called you about the music, though, and I wanted to ask you, my brother, he, he used to play with the Motown groups. They were in a cover band. I guess that's what you call it, opening band. Sure. And they were in a very famous um, band called Tommy Van and Echoes, and they played with just about all of them, the Temptations, Platter Spinners, or Oh, cool. Um, and this was on the East Coast because we're from Baltimore. And um, anyway, they called it Blue-Eyed Soul. Right. And because it was, you know, white boys singing um, right. soul music, and not many of them could capture that essence. Very and true. I think they were actually one of the first bands that integrated because... Just back in the early 60s, I was just a baby then. I was born in 64. And um, anyway, they, their drummer, they were, have, they were playing. Their drummer was strung out on drugs. So they went down to the black club, and they watched a you know, drummer there, and they liked him. So they asked him to come up and finish the set with them. And they liked him so much, they asked him to join the band and all that. Um, but they were called Tommy Van and the Echoes. Interesting. Have you ever heard of the Blue Eyed Soul? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So Blue Eyed Soul is a whole genre of music. Yeah, I, I'll give you another great example. I think of Blue Eyed Soul, and that's uh, the earliest Hall and Oates, um, like she's gone. The songs from Abandoned Luncheonette. They were trying to evoke the TSOP. They were trying to evoke Motown, and they they captured it in a way which ref- reflected who they were. Um, and a lot of some of the British invasion bands did were kind of in the blue eyed soul. Like I think the Yardbirds were um, for a while, and uh, and then they went pop. But yeah, I, it's a it's a forgotten aspect of music because a lot of the black performers at the time were both 
envious and appreciative of that because they were like, thank you for calling attention to our music. But they weren't they weren't the ones getting the lion's share of the attention or the money for that matter. So, yeah. Uh, I, 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 lo- I think you may be right on that integrated thing. There's some really, I mean, remember even Barry Gordy himself had to start another label for white audiences for because there was a revolt on the Motown side. So he started Rare Earth Records uh, and Rare Earth still an amazing live concert band. Thank you, uh, Ruth. We're still counting down, trying to get everybody in before top of the hour. Jeff is in North Carolina on Coast to Coast. Jeff? Hi, Ian. This is Jeff from North Carolina. Go Tar Heels. Beat Duke. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you can say beat Duke, I'm in. <laughs> Uh, I want you to put on your theology hat with my question. Uh, sure. uh, but first, I have a quick joke I heard from Bart Ehrman on his uh, YouTube channel, his favorite Jesus joke. Okay, go ahead. It has to do with the woman taken in adultery, which everybody knows. All right. Story. Uh, a woman was caught in adultery. She was uh, brought before uh, Jesus. Uh, the, the people who caught her said, um, this woman was caught in adultery. We need to stone her to death because that's what the... Uh, Scripture said, but you say, Jesus, that we, we should forgive her. What shall we do? Well, Jesus was riding on the ground, and he looked up at the crowd, and he said, Let the person without sin cast the first stone. Right. And then, from the back, then from the back of the crowd comes this rock, and it sails over everybody's head and knocks the poor woman on the head who committed adultery. And Jesus stands up, and he looks over the crowd, and he finds the person who threw, threw the stone, and he said, Mom, I thought I told you to stay out of my work. That's funny. I wasn't sure whether you were going to go mom or dad, but I like that one. My, uh, my, I'll, I'll tell you one real, too, real quickly. So my, um, my brother, my oldest brother likes to send me a joke a day in a text. And um, it just so happened that I had my, uh, my younger son who's off to um, spend another four months or so at a, at a monastery. He was in the car. So I'm reading to him the joke from my brother. And it, it was, this is why did the chicken go to the seance? Why? So, okay. So the punchline that my, uh, uh, my brother sent me is because he wanted to go to the other side. My son said, I thought this was very clever. He goes, no, he was trying to summon a poultry geist. And I thought, dang, that's a good joke. <laughs> so, that's better than the original one. Right? Yeah, it is better. All right, go ahead. So what were you calling about? My question to you, I recently read a book called Four Views of Hell, published by Zondervan, the, the Christian publisher. Right. And the, each chapter uh, gives a different interpretation of what hell is. The first chapter is on eternal conscious torment, which we, we all know. Second would be annihilationism, where the unrepentant sinners are annihilated. The third was on universalism, where all the re- unrepentant sinners and repentant sinners enter, end up in, in heaven, including uh, Satan and his demons. And the fourth was on purgatory. Yeah. Now, there's all four views cannot all be true at the same time. They they logically contradict each other. That is, if universalism yeah. is true, then eternal conscious torment cannot be true. And yet, they were well respected theologians, pastors, and philosophers all defended each one of these categories uh, using the same Bible, sometimes the same verses. And I was wondering which one of those you subscribe to, and how do you reconcile the contradictory interpretation that these pastors have gotten out of this the same Bible. Okay. So really good question. Let me just say, remember for most of the Bible, the concept of hell is really shoal, right? I'm assuming they, they address that in the book and that there was no immediacy to anything. You were buried because you were dead. And, um, and that whatever happens later on, is what we get as our quote unquote final reward. I I just don't worry. I don't even think about it. So I mean, I I certainly read. I I read. Let me just say that I'll, I'll phrase it differently. I read all of those probably just like you do. I read I read them 
with equal interest and said, well, there's a good point. Well, there's a good point. But I don't I think they are mutually exclusive. And I don't think I feel the need to to say this one is right. I'm not enough of anything to say this one is right. And the Episcopal Church that I belong to, hell is a little more conceptual. We just kind of think about hell as being a, a, a life away from God, however you look at that. So, so you just kind of leave it as an open question? I do. But I mean, why? Why? I can't. I haven't died. I, I haven't answered it. I, I, I just saw the other day somebody else um, actually was in the paper, I think, uh, or is on a website that I was reading, and they talked about the fact that they had died on an operating table. They were brain dead for a period of time. Their heart had stopped. They were dead. But their vision of what they saw afterward was very different than what they were expecting. And I thought, yeah, that's probably that's probably true. That you know, we can we can put together all these highfalutin arguments because you know theologians are right. they're good that's at that. They yeah, it's what they do. So, uh, which one do you do you have, did you have a fave in the end? Well, I'm I'm an atheist, so I don't think any of them are correct. Right. I just think I just think we we pass away and that's it. There's and that could be right. Ends. Right. Okay. And that could be right until. Whatever, but uh, yeah, exactly. So I don't, and maybe and people, I get all sorts of nasty letters every time I'm on the show. Uh, I do, and it, you are not a Christian, but it's because I I do open up questions and I do look at things in terms of parables, and parables don't have easy answers. So you know, if Jesus spoke in parables, why can't I? You know, why can't I understand things in terms of parables? But I love what you had to say there. So thank you so much. It was a great way to. Get us closer to the end of the show, and uh, that brings us to Randy in Florida on Coast to Coast. Randy? Good morning, Ian. I wanted to bring up the, uh, due to his recent passing, I wanted to bring up the parrot head phenomenon that oh, yeah. was created. Yeah. And my wife, my wife and I became parrot heads uh, in kind of an unusual way. Uh, he fell off a trailer. He was uh, playing Shut a second up. show in Gainesville, Florida, at, at the Wright Union lawn, and he fell off the flatbed trailer about one thirty in the morning. Uh, my wife and I were in our teens at that time, and uh, she became smitten and decided she wanted to attend uh, as many Jim and Buffett shows as the parrot head. Oh, and, fun. Uh, uh, she could, and we ended up in 1994 in a music video for two days down at oh, fun. Studios in Orlando. Which vi- video which which video? Fruitcakes. Oh, fruit okay. Cakes. I don't remember. I don't. No, uh, we we are fruitcakes and have been for uh, uh, six, <laughs> six years together, and uh, it was just a blast to spend two days in a full length black tuxedo with a pith helmet and a blender on my head. Oh, that's so funny. Full feathered uh, green parrot costume. Uh, she created this parrot costume to get Jimmy's attention, and it worked. Uh, she was on stage with him several times, and uh, so if you watch the fruitcakes video, look for the green parrot. Uh, and, uh, I will do that. The guy in the black tuxedo with the pith helmet and blood okay. on his head. So here I, I'll tie you and the last caller together. And I'll tell you, I wrote an article, it's chapter 16 in the second volume of a book called Religion Online. It's an academic tomb, but uh, the, the, the article I wrote was called Festivals in the Digital Age. And it was all about the Internet's role in cultural religions. And obviously, Jimmy Buffett was a cultural religion. And so it, um, the subtitle was uh, The Internet's Role in Cultural Religions from Deadheads to Parrotheads to Spreadheads. Uh, and, uh, and I wrote, I think you can find it online if you go to... Um, Google Scholar. So if you ever go to Google Scholar, just dial that up and you can read the article. And I talk a lot about Jimmy Buffett uh, and that phenomenon. So I didn't know I was talking about you, but apparently I was. Uh, Gary is in Pennsylvania on Coast to Coast. Gary? Yeah, thanks for getting me in. I really appreciate it. 
I, I, I went and saw that movie, that new Martin Scorsese movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, what was? I heard it was kind of depressing, but I at the same time, I heard it was brilliant. It's a great film. It's three and a half hours long, but you know he's one of the last great American filmmakers. Left. I agree. He's one of the best. You know, I and, agree. Uh, you know, Robert De Niro is the best movie he's been in in years. I mean, he, he was really great. He was right. He and DiCaprio was good. DiCaprio, I heard some. Jesse Plemons pops in there. Oh yeah. There's this, Woman Lily Gladstone. I never heard of her before. She was fantastic. It's a long movie, but I'll tell you, if, if you like, a, not a movie, a film. Yeah. It is a great, if, he, if, this, know, is, if this is one of Scorsese's last film, he went out on top. Yeah, I appreciate that, you saying that about him. I'm a big fan. And uh, I was surprised when I saw the, the commercials. And they said, uh, from the director that gave you casino and goodfellas and i went wait a second why we're not saying scorsese i mean don't say from the guy who brought you those other movies that's for lesser people so yeah i've heard that i I also saw some people busting on brendan frazier in that movie but i will go see it when i got three and a half hours coming up sometime maybe around the holidays all right listen you all were great if you've seen what's coming up this weekend, some terrific shows tomorrow night and Sunday night. Find out more on the website. In the meantime, Deus Te Amat, and I do too.